The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen Part 1 Hello, this is Natasha and I'm dropping by with a story about a mermaid who is so famous that there is a statue of her in Copenhagen which is the capital of Denmark. As it happens, Denmark is the country where the author comes from. His name is Hans Christian Andersen, and he also wrote The Snow Queen, which is one of the all-time favourite stories on Story Nori. The Little Mermaid is a beautiful story too, and also quite a long one. So I'm going to tell it in three parts. Far out in the ocean, where the water is as blue as the prettiest cornflower and as clear as crystal, it is very, very deep. So deep indeed that no cable could fathom it. Many church steeples piled one upon another would not reach from the ground beneath to the surface of the water above. There dwell the sea king and his subjects. We must not imagine that there is nothing at the bottom of the sea but bare yellow sand. No, indeed. The most unusual flowers and plants grow there, the leaves and stems of which are so delicate that the slightest movement of the water causes them to stir as if they had life. Fishes both large and small, glide between the branches as birds fly among the trees here upon the land. In the deepest spot of all stands the castle of the Sea King. Its walls are built of coral and the long Gothic windows are of the clearest amber. The roof is formed of shells that open and close as the water flows among them. Their appearance is very beautiful, for in each lies a glittering pearl, which would be fit for the diadem of a queen. The Sea King's queen had died many years before, and his aged mother kept house for him. She was a very wise woman, and exceedingly proud of her high birth. On that account, she wore twelve oysters on her tail, while others, also of a high rank, were only allowed to wear six. She was, however, deserving of very great praise, especially for her care of the little sea princesses, her granddaughters. They were six beautiful children, but the youngest was the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as the deepest sea. But like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish tail. All day long they played in the great halls of the castle, or among the living flowers that grew out of the walls. The large amber windows were open, and the fish swam in, just as the swallows might fly into our houses when we open the windows, except that the fish swam up to the princesses, ate out of their hands, and allowed themselves to be stroked. Outside the castle there was a beautiful garden, in which grew bright red and dark blue flowers and blossoms like flames of fire. The fruit glittered like gold and the leaves and stems waved to and fro continually. 
The earth itself was the finest sand, but blue as the flame of burning sulphur. Over everything lay a peculiar blue radiance, as if it were surrounded by the air from above, through which the blue sky shone through, instead of the dark depths of the sea. In calm weather, the sun could be seen, looking like a purple flower, with the light streaming from within it. Each of the young princesses had a little plot of ground in the garden, where she might dig and plant as she pleased. One arranged her flower bed into the form of a whale. Another thought it better to make hers like the figure of a little mermaid. But that of the youngest was round like the sun, and contained flowers as red as his rays at sunset. She was a strange child, quiet and thoughtful, and while her sisters would be delighted with the wonderful things which they obtained from the wrecks of vessels, she cared for nothing but her pretty red flowers like the sun, except a beautiful marble statue. It was the representation of a handsome boy carved out of pure white stone, which had fallen to the bottom of the sea from a wreck. She planted by the statue a rose-coloured weeping willow. It grew splendidly, and very soon hung its fresh branches over the statue, almost down to the blue sands. The shadow had a violent tint, and waved to and fro like the branches. It seemed as if the crown of the tree and the root were at play and trying to kiss each other. Nothing gave her so much pleasure as to hear about the world above the sea. She made her old grandmother tell her all she knew of the ships and of the towns, the people and the animals. To her it seemed most wonderful and beautiful to hear that the flowers of the land should have fragrance and not those below the sea, that the trees of the forest should be green, and that the fishes among the trees could sing so sweetly that it was quite a pleasure to hear them. Her grandmother called the little birds fishes, or she would not have understood her for she had never seen birds. When you have reached your fifteenth year, said her grandmother, you will have permission to rise up out of the sea to sit on the rock in the moonlight, while the great ships are sailing by, and then you will see both forests and towns. In the following year, one of the sisters would be fifteen, but as each was a year younger than the other, the youngest would have to wait five years before her turn came to rise up from the bottom of the ocean and see the earth as we do. However, each promised to tell the others what she saw on their first visit and what she thought was the most beautiful. For their grandmother could not tell them enough. There were so many things in which they wanted information. None of them longed so much for her turn to come as the youngest, she who had the longest time to wait, and who was so quiet and thoughtful. Many nights she stood by the open window, looking up through the dark blue water and watching the fish as they splashed about with their fins and tails. She could see the moon and stars shining faintly. 
but through the water they looked larger than they do in our eyes. When something like a black cloud passed between her and them, she knew that it was either a whale swimming overhead or a ship full of human beings who never imagined that a pretty little mermaid was standing beneath them holding her white hands towards the keel of their ship. As soon as the eldest was fifteen, she was allowed to rise to the surface of the ocean. When she came back, she had hundreds of things to talk about, but the most beautiful, she said, was to lie in the moonlight on a sandbank in the quiet sea near the coast and to gaze on a large town nearby where the lights were twinkling like hundreds of stars, to listen to the sounds of the music, the noise of carriages and the voices of human beings. And then to hear the merry bells peal out from the church steeples. And because she could not go near to all those wonderful things, she longed for them more than ever. Oh, did not the younger sister listen eagerly to all these descriptions? And afterwards, when she stood at the open window, looking up through the dark blue water, she thought of the great city with all its bustle and noise, and even fancied she could hear the sound of the church bells down in the depths of the sea. When first the sisters had permission to rise to the surface, they were each delighted with the new and beautiful sights they saw. But now, as grown-up girls, they could go where they pleased, and they had become indifferent about it. They longed for their life under the surface of the water, and after a month had passed they said it was much more beautiful down below and pleasanter to be at home. Yet often, in the evening hours, the five sisters would twine their arms round each other and rise to the surface in a row. They had more beautiful voices than any human being could have, and before the approach of a storm, and when they expected a ship would be lost, they swam before the vessel and they sang sweetly of the delights to be found in the depths of the sea, and begging the sailors not to fear if they sank to the bottom. But the sailors could not understand the song, and they took it for the howling of the storm. And these things were never to be beautiful for them. For if the ship sank, the men were drowned, and their dead bodies alone reached the palace of the Sea King. When the sisters rose arm in arm through the water in this way, their youngest sister would stand quite alone, looking after them, ready to cry, only that the mermaids have no tears, and therefore they suffer more. Oh, were I but fifteen years old, said she. I know that I shall love the world up there, and all the people who live in it. And that's the first part of The Little Mermaid by Hans Christian Andersen. Soon I will tell you how the Little Mermaid reached her 15th birthday and was allowed to go up to the surface of the sea and how she saved a prince from drowning. I do hope you will drop by soon and hear the rest of the story. And don't forget, we have loads more stories at storynoi.com. For now, from me, Natasha, bye-bye!